Hi, I'm Jeff Farnwald, Director of the MBA Program at Rockford College. About 18 months ago, the Rockford Chamber of Commerce set out to make networking easier in Rockford by identifying area people you should know in business. Currently, 41 people have been recognized and celebrated as one of these people. This series of talks held at Rockford College was designed to provide a vehicle for the public to hear from and learn about each of the people you should know. I hope you enjoy this talk. Welcome to Rockford College for our People You Should Know talks. Today it is my pleasure to introduce Lorraine Logan, founder and president of Workplace Staffing and a 2011 People You Should Know Award recipient. Workplace Staffing specializes in behavioral and safety-based approaches to employee selection and placement. In 2008 and 2010, Workplace Staffing was listed in Forbes and Fortune magazines as one of the 10 most dependable staffing firms in the Midwest. Lorraine is actively involved in the Rockford community, serving as chair of the City of Rockford Fire and Police Commission, president of the Rockford Symphony Orchestra Foundation, and was recently elected to the Board of Governors of the Rockford Country Club. Her talk today is titled Career Moves, Knowing and Spotlighting Your Strengths and Abilities. Please help me welcome Lorraine Logan. I must tell you, you're not the audience I expected. I thought actually that I would be talking to a lot of people, and maybe I hope Nate's one of them, um, who are first-time job seekers. So um, bear with me as I, as I come through here, because um, with that said, you're going to understand that I may tailor this a little bit toward people um, who, who would be coming out looking for a job. But conversely, thinking this morning, I decided that we're almost always candidating as we move through life. Um, whether it's about personal relationships, to be, a, to be named one of the 20 people you should know, I think discreetly, unknowingly, we were working with peers and colleagues and they were thinking about whether we deserve to be recognized, so we were, in, we were indirectly candidating. So my message today is about candidating and I hopefully, I'm going to give you some skills that will be helpful as you um, serve as an employer or a candidate. Last fall, Lauren sent a message around to the people you should know and she said, would you give a talk about something you feel passionately about? Well, I do feel passionately about getting people connected to their right work. Enough so that I started a company 25 years ago and I have continued to just love, love, love being involved in this putting people and opportunities together. We not only need employment to sustain ourselves financially, but I believe we need employment to feel engaged and really alive. I spent a period before I started the company where I created what I called my professional vacuum. I wanted to see what I was gonna do with having nothing to do. Now, I left a government job and um, didn't really realize that we were in the depths of a very serious recession. So I got pretty hungry and I got very scared, but I did a lot of reflecting, a lot of deciding who I was, and I came to a pr pretty profound awareness that love and work are the two most critical expressions in our lives. And at that point, the light went on that this is what I want to be about. I want to be about helping people be connected with work that really matters to them. So that's why I started the business. That's what I wanted to help you uh, be part of in, in having meaningful work for you or selecting people for whom the work is meaningful. And I want to show you some numbers, though, that said we've got a lot to, to overcome. Um, Harvard Business Review points out that 80% of employee turnover is due to bad hiring. And in 2012, CareerBuilder did an online survey of 2,500 um, respondents, and they found that the cost of a bad hire ranges between $24,000 and $50,000. Now, I've actually read higher numbers on more, Kathy's nodding her head, if you guys make a decision at really high levels in your in the BMO system, you're talking a couple hundred thousand dollars. And just last year, 69% of the respondents said, oh yeah, it's happened to us. We have been adversely affected by bad hires. So that's from the employer perspective, but 
when i think about what it costs the job seeker that's really profound for me because it's immeasurable it's an affront to self esteem it can harm reputation and it can actually create some difficulty moving forward as you try to make other career moves so i'd like to talk about the elements that contribute to mismatches in hiring and they happen on both sides of the equation on the candidate side and the employer side so factors that the employer brings to play are this they believe there is an excess supply of talent you know, they, we have clients all the time say to us, unemployment rate's 10%, unemployment rate's 14%. Why aren't you producing more candidates? Why, why, is it, why are these candidates not quite maybe what we have in mind? I mean, they read that stat and they think that just there's talent walking around all over. Conversely, Gallup wrote a book, the chairman of Gallup wrote a book recently called The Coming Talent War. I would say we're already in, in the early stages of the talent war. There's a tremendous skill gap going on globally. This great recession of 2008, 2009 was really a reorganization recession. And part of why you can have 14% unemployed is because they don't have the skills to participate in today's workplace. I mean, where you are seeing out at Hamilton Sunstrand, you are seeing very high level, high, high critical thinking work. And, and as somebody who was racking and picking and packing are part of the 14% and they're not going to be able to fulfill that role. Another situation is a lot of times employers put too much emphasis on compensation and skill. So the compensation part, I'll tell you, goes like this. They'll list the position with us. They'll say, this is the range we're going to pay. Then they meet the talent they want. All of a sudden, that range is looking a little different. And I'm going to cite for you an individual who, on paper, would have never been considered for a position. He was in this room when, and Jeff knows him, when Pete Provenzano, the CEO of Supply Corp, spoke. And you saw his um, uh, strategic aide sitting right here in the front row. So when Pete, who's a friend of mine, told me he needed an EA, that what he had wasn't working because he had a traditional kind of relationship, kind of a traditional skill set, he wanted something different. But I'm not so sure, like a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of CEOs, wasn't altogether sh sure of what different looked like. So we kissed some frogs, we searched, we searched, and finally, we made a match. But here's what this resume looks like. Got a short stint on jobs, September 11 to June 12, May 10 to July 11. He was a warehouse manager. He was uh, an assistant of director of administration. This doesn't sound like understands an entrepreneur, understands a top level person, blah, blah. He even has a master's in conflict analysis and resolution. So, uh, you know, still not so sure. But here's one good point. He's proficient in Microsoft Suite. Okay, he can do the word in Excel. But then he tells me some strengths. Communicates clearly and efficiently, effectively, in or, both in oral and writing form. He's an innovative problem solver, specializing in cross-discipline solutions. Now we're starting to get some strengths, not just some skills. And most interestingly, when we talked to him, he said he had coordinated meetings for th the staff of a three-star general. Okay, we've got a Department of Defense contractor looking for strategic aid. Now it's starting to come together. And in reality, we find out that Blake actually has security clearance from the Department of Defense. He started work in November of 12, and it's going quite swimmingly, I would report to you. So you can't put too much on compensation and skill. A lot of individuals interview without structure. So there's lack of clarity, there's lack of focus, and a lot of times there is lack of participation from the candidate. If there's not 
a team doing an interview where they're sort of forced to have to listen more and if you just have an individual interviewing another individual what you have is somebody telling what they want and what they need and what the job is and the candidate sitting there waiting for his or her chance to speak so part of why it, people end up with folks they don't really want is they didn't really spend enough time determining whether this was somebody they really needed and should have. Another part is how we determine that somebody sh fits or should be hired. And it's because we don't really fully assess the qualities needed for success in the job. 21% of the career builder respondents said that they had had insufficient talent intelligence before making their decision. And if we look at a candidate up against a job description, instead of what we expect them to achieve, we also most likely will make a poor hire. Of course, we can feel rushed about needing to fill a position and we let the, de the requirement, the demand, the, the need determine uh, a hire rather than letting the process prevail and committed to stay, committing to stay in process till we have the right person. So that's what happens in our view on the employer side. Here's how the job seeker participates. They of course feel great pressure to find a job. So they're in the hurry mode too. They narrow their search in because they may say, well, I'm really only qualified for this, or I really only want this, or I only know people at this place. So they, they take this sort of narrow. But regardless of what they do, they've got a one-size-fits-all cover letter and resume. And they, uh, part of that happens because we tend to have a fairly limited self-assessment and self-identification. And I'm going to talk about how you build that because you need to broaden what you know about yourself. So let's look at how you can navigate the environment to ensure that you make sound career moves. And the first is to focus on your strengths. And now I'm not talking about your education, your degrees, your skills, or your resume. There's really a faulty idea when we say you can be anything you want to be if you just try hard enough. The reality is we have innate talent, we have a strength zone, and we can acquire some skills to complement that, but we need to work in a space that uses our innate talent. We also need a high emotional intelligence. Over the decade, there has been emphasis placed on our IQ, but I wanna tell you that 93 to 95 percent of workplace problems have to do with people and that's about your EQ. Only five to seven have to do with your intelligence. So knowing that 47 percent or more of the jobs in today's workplace involve interaction, interpersonal, you need to cultivate your EQ. There are ways to measure it and there are ways to grow it. And I encourage you to be diligent about continually doing that. Every once in a while, I'll see myself doing one and I'll think, oh boy, that was a drop in your EQ. You better go back and look at those exercises in that category. When you start deciding to pursue employment or whatever, a board, whatever, put the lens on you the way the employer would look at you and say to yourself, what specific contributions am I gonna be able to make based on those I have already demonstrated? So if you're not new to the workforce, that's okay. You have been a volunteer, you have been um, something where you've found out some of your strengths, some of how you coordinate um, activity and you know things about yourself. And so you can say, I know I could do this because I saw myself do this as a scout or I saw myself do this as a CASA volunteer. Find out those, or think about those kinds of things about yourself. And I will tell you that if 
we are in fact in a talent war, and I know that we are, you are in the driver's seat. So it is important that you find opportunities that align with your values, your talent, and your particular career goals. This is very different from, I need a job, I'm gonna get a job. Look for that alignment. I want you to develop a personal marketing statement. And for those of you who, and I'm gonna speak about Tiffany because I know her, you already are in a lot of places, you may not imagine yourself being promoted for something else, but develop a personal marketing statement because we all can use them on a drop of a hat like that. You may get called to be send a bio or whatever. And if you create this statement about you, you'll be surprised how many times it's needed. And if you're entering the job market, it's a very important addition to your resume because resumes are increasingly well developed, but they still are a little bit, what I wanna call an, an obituary. They're a little bit of what you've done. So this is what I've done, but now this is compelling language about who I really am, and you're gonna include statements about your emotional, you know, categories in which you show your emotional strength, or your, your emotional intelligence, and, and you're gonna show your strengths. D depending on what you're going into, you also need an industry-relevant resume. I would assume there are people in here, well, you work for Rockford College, emphasis on ed education, where you attained, where you attained it is very, very important. There could be positions where it would be less important. So you don't have to start with the education. You want to start with perhaps your accomplishments in this area of expertise that you hold. And then before you apply, do a lot of learning. Learn about the culture, the values, the leadership, so that you know what kind of organization you might potentially be entering. And if you find out through your colleagues or LinkedIn, just network, network till you can get as direct an experience as possible of the inner workings of that enterprise. And I'm gonna encourage you to pass if it's not a fit for you. Don't even apply if it's not a fit for you. Because you don't wanna become part of the people who are dead on their jobs. You just don't have to do it, and I encourage you to don't, don't develop that practice. Now, if you apply and appear before an interview team, you need to Google and research it within your network and find out all you can about this interview team. And I'm gonna use myself as an example. I'm chair of fire police commission, so I interview the fire union, the police union says not enough people every year, but I still will tell you I see a lot of people every year. Um, I don't know if people Google me, but if they do, they're gonna find out that I have some pretty strong values, you know? I believe a, a, a lot in civic engagement. I, and you can just, you can really find out what filter that interviewer is gonna hear your responses through. So find out all you can about the interview team. In, he, in this environment, you'd wanna know what are their degrees and you're gonna, you're gonna really get a sense of what matters to them. Then you need to rehearse. Find someone who really cares about you, who will give you caring and constructive uh, feedback on how you present yourself. And I want you to rehearse enough that you lose your, your fear. Your, your nervousness and some of the, the ticks or whatever that you might that might hold you back in the interview. Be prepared at the close of the interview to ask questions. And those do not include what is the salary and what are the benefits. Mm -hmm. Those you never ask. Uh, but what you do ask is how will you determine if I have succeeded in this role? And you will also ask, what are the core values that drive your organization? You will have other questions, but be prepared with them. Michael and I are very impressed when candidates interview with us and they at the end 
open their portfolio and they have written the questions. They have researched the client for whom they're interviewing. They have researched the position for which they're interviewing. I, maybe they've researched us, but they come ready. And it's not impressive when you don't have a question. And I'm giving you two, so at least you've got two. Um, possesses self-knowledge coupled with very solid preparedness. And this led him to being selected for a highly prestigious position. It is a role that requires a really high degree of emotional intelligence because he must navigate an extensive network of relationships. This individual worked in the corporate world for 17 years and he had increased responsibility. He ended that phase of his career as a vice president with a very venerable financial institution. And we can only speculate on the depth and breadth of interpersonal skill it took, coupling, coupled with um, high level of competency, of course, but the depth it took to serve as a vice president of trust services. Now, notable career moves often entail using some transferable skills. This individual, in 1992, successfully moved into the education space. He stayed a vice president, but now over administration of Benedictine University. He also worked as an associate professor in the MBA program, where he used, the transfer, used transferable skills to teach students about the expectations and the realities of the business world. Working within his strength zone, this accomplished professional moved to the presidency of Urbana University, where his achievements were significant in number and scope. He remained there for seven years. They probably thought they'd made a good hire. In 2008, a struggling institution sought a candidate with a proven track record. A candidate with business acumen, keen intellect, critical thinking skills, leadership ability, and outstanding interpersonal skills. I called the uh, interview, the search uh, chair, to ask him kind of what the experience was with this candidate. And he said, well, of course we were very attracted to his strong financial background. And he had a history of implementing processes which enhanced the performance of the organization where he was. And he exuded integrity. Two or three times he mentioned integrity. Well, I happen to know that this candidate has a strength of placing value on honesty and loyalty. And that's why they picked up on the fact that he has a good deal of integrity. So based on his experience, his strength, and his emotional intelligence, Dr. Robert Head became the president of Rockford College. And I understand that they recently extended his contract. So I think they're going, we have really made a good hire. We're going to offer him two more years or whatever it was. So let's just look at this accomplished gentleman. He has self-awareness and self-management. For any of us, and most of us have worked with him, we really get how well he does that. He also is extremely socially aware, and he can manage his social environment deltly, beautifully. His strengths are in the category of strategic thinking, executing, and relationship building. So it wasn't just that he has this PhD, and he has this MBA, and he has this master's, because those alone would not have been enough for him to have done all he's done at Urbana, Benedictine, Urbana, and now, thankfully for us, at Rockford College. So, 
I would just like to say to you that when you contemplate career moves, you have the opportunity to be engaged and to feel fully alive. You have the opportunity to bring great value to an organization. And you do that. Your asset is your natural talent. And that's how you give your best. I believe that human resources is on the threshold of smarter and more effective selection processes. I think those early stats are going to go down. And it's going to happen because candidates are more astute and we, 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 we have a new process. We streamline and we're more conscious about how we do it. This is no longer because I'm a person, I know how to read people. This is, this is an art and a science. I thank you and I welcome you to um, contact me at any time if I can be of any service to any of you. And if on the moment you have questions, I welcome those as well.